Hey everybody, welcome to Untapped episode 18. We've got very special guest today, Logan Jones, strength and conditioning coach of the Chicago White Sox, Major League Baseball organization. We got Levi Kelly of the Arizona Diamondbacks, hobbyist, expert in combat <laughs> sports. I always like to play with that. Then we got Dana back here on everything. He's a Doc's Beat in music Ooh. production. Go check out Doc's Beat in Sutton House. And we got, I'm Kyle Hannon, world record holder, surviving the most chemotherapy, and also the cancer patient with the largest biceps in the world. So can't wait to, to get to know a little more about Logan and talk about strength and conditioning, optimizing health. Health, really, we try to focus on this podcast is where, where do people go when they get into that difficult place, that dark place where they're pushed beyond their limits in that untapped space and like what comes out of it we're really interested in how to optimize health how to optimize strength and maximize that conditioning in those places so how did you get into strength and conditioning yeah first and foremost thank you guys for having me on Dude, i appreciate the you. opportunity um just to come and chop it up and and talk shop so i really appreciate it you guys have done excellent work and and thank obviously you. we'll continue to do so but uh how did i get into strength and conditioning so um, we'll take it back. Like I've always um, had a passion for just uh, like a physical state of being. I'll say that grew up in, a, in an athletic family, um, grew up around baseball, played baseball collegiately uh, at Guilford College. And I, and I knew that when I was finished uh, playing the sport that, you know, in some capacity, I wanted to stay in baseball. So uh, that kind of led me in the direction of strength and conditioning and and uh, didn't initially know where that was going to lead. Um, I, I relied heavily upon some of my mentors and some of like uh, some some close friends that, that kind of helped me to establish like what it is that I wanted to get out of uh, my career and, and like in what direction I wanted to, to take this thing. So I was trying to decide like, do I, do I stay at the collegiate level and go more of a grad internship or grad graduate assistantship? Do I try to, you know, initially get into baseball right out of undergrad? And and uh, long story short, I did a couple of collegiate internships, one at the University of Kentucky, uh, one at Wake Forest University, working with a variety of sports um, that kind of opened my eyes to, you know, getting out on the floor, coaching, um, understanding what it was like to work in a team aspect as, as a leader and as a coach, as opposed to being uh, an athlete, um, the much different dynamic. Um, and then ultimately, fortunate enough, in 2018, got my first exposure, uh, first full-time job in, in professional baseball with the Arizona Diamondbacks. So I met Levi. Um, we, we joined together in, in 18 as our first seasons with the D-backs. And uh, uh, just most recently, as you touched on, uh, joined the Chicago White Sox organization uh, this past November and, and making a move there, um, joining a, a dynamic uh, White Sox performance team. And I uh, think we're headed in a, in a really special direction um, so that's just a quick backstory. Nice. Yeah, love there it. We got to work. I, I figured it was either an athletic background or maybe a cowboy. I see a little bit of cowboy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well like I'll say I'll say this. I'll say this. My family, a uh, family family has a couple of horses. We have a donkey uh, satchel. Nice. So my, my mom, my mom uh, is a horseback rider. My dad, not so much. Um, I, I I toyed around with the idea, but yeah. the first time that I that I ended up on the ground, it was that was it for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> you live and you learn, right? <laughs> Did you play any other sports besides baseball? Um, it, it, through middle school, I played basketball, uh, played a season or two of football, kicked around the soccer ball a little bit. But for the most part, like baseball was, is, and always has been kind of uh, yeah. where I've where I've found like my true state of being and my and, and happiness. So, yeah, and I'm yeah. super fortunate now to just lit, you know, continue to live in that environment as a performance coach, as a strength and conditioning coach, trying to like understand, obviously strength and conditioning in baseball is much different than, a, than a lot of sports from a skill aspect. Sure. Um, we may get into that a little later, but just yeah. the, the nuances of that uh, living in a performance type environment have really uh, opened my eyes to like, Okay. The, you, t you touched on like getting in, 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 in an untapped space and and like what goes into that and it's and it's multifactorial for sure. for sure. So heck yeah, you follow UFC or MMA type I, of stuff. I, I, as as of late, like as you spend more time around Levi, <laughs> you start to like you know whether you like it or not, you're gonna have some exposure. We're gonna talk about UFC and fighting. <laughs> heck yeah. So I'm, heck I'm yeah. yeah yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah, videos are rolling around on the ground and. and but, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. What, what you guys all think about it, uh, if you haven't watched the UFC 285 last night? Um, I'm trying to think of all the fights. Garbrandt, I thought he looked like 
eh, whatever. Yeah. He didn't look great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I just don't even watch. I didn't even watch him. That's how I'm uninterested. I, I like. I, I actually like Cody, but he just. I don't know. He's scared to get hit. Rightfully so. Yeah. He got punched twice, and he almost. I mean, he wobbled both times. I think the guy landed like four strikes until the third, so it was like pretty lopsided. But there wasn't a lot going on. I feel like when you dancing. take that much head damage, it's time to maybe go into jujitsu. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, he's just fighting to fight now. Like, he, yeah. I don't see him ever being at the top of the division anymore. No. The bow nickel looked pretty awesome. I thought. I know there's a yeah. little controversy. Yeah, I think the guy. Why? That, what was the controversy? Uh, the, the the guys. He's filing an appeal that he took a knee to the nuts before the oh, takedown, and he's claiming that that's how he got him down and won the fight and the ref never saw it so yeah good luck i saw that, that. <laughs> i saw him go like ah, and then he took him down but yeah. dude he was in head and arm for oh, like yeah yeah three minutes and not it's doing not do, yeah not doing yeah. a damn thing like yeah. completely gave up but i don't yeah. know yeah again yeah. didn't really watch any of that i watched like, grasso and i watched jones and that was it <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the jones fight was what two minutes yeah yeah, not yeah. Even, yeah. yeah. Oh. minute 20 yeah yeah, I, I was disappointed. Darn it! Yeah. With the He's Jones been out <laughs> of the sport for three years, and then just went in at a different, heavier weight and got the belt <laughs> like uh, that easy. Yeah, if, but, if it were only that easy, right? If you just show up and you just right, yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. I think that part of that is John Jones is like a real deal athlete. Like, yeah. I think, he, but compared I, to like most of those dudes are, I would say probably. 60 70 percent of those guys are more fighters than athlete like john jones is like athlete fighter yeah 100 yeah. percent. i was still sitting there thinking though what's this guy on right now <laughs> yeah i don't so, know it's hard to tell with jones history yeah good. his yeah. track record isn't great <laughs> but whatever. What, what frustrated me in that fight is his opponent gone when he got down on the cage and and this could be me not understanding everything, what it feels like, that whole takedown sequence of wrestling and how tired you are. But he didn't fight the hands at all on that guillotine. That really, that bugged me. It's like, come on, fight the hands at least. Yeah. So I'm like, you just kind of like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> I think he was overwhelmed by like yeah. the whole fighting John Jones thing. I would be too. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's, it. it's, he looked huge. He looked yeah. so shocked afterwards. He like, <laughs> yeah. What hit me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll definitely. see he's got what six more fights on his contract so he'll be yeah he'll I mean, be around for a knows? minute who knows he he said he wants to fight a lot but we'll see i don't know he says what about you when you fight <laughs> i'm throwing you good right yeah, now you pitched yesterday right <laughs> yeah no, no, no. when did i throw uh, yeah yeah yesterday oh, not yeah. a lot of talk about the fighting thing right now <laughs> <laughs> yesterday was my best outing probably in since covid fuck yeah so it was good yeah he's back i swear i went to the third base side of the rubber and it like game some dialed me in yeah <laughs> from from like a command standpoint my stuff was my stuff's been good it's just kind of like been zoning it in and i went to a third base side yesterday and it was like money so Damn. we'll stay on the third base side for Let's now go i saw lyle lynn plays Mm -hmm. with the deep x do you throw to him at all i was team managing at asu when he, he knows there. lyle too oh okay yeah, yeah. i uh, had no I've idea thrown to him before yeah that's funny he's supposedly like i haven't played with him for a full season i don't really know supposedly like pretty good he's yeah a, he's a really good defensive catch i haven't been, oh, yeah. like, like i, know, I haven't I, seen I, him i know a lot. a lot of guys like to throw to him uh just a, a good presence behind the plate just a good i would say from a leadership standpoint but then like his ability to frame pitches and steal strikes pitches that are balls yeah. in frames and makes them look like strikes and and uh, I forgot what the metric is but they they track that there's a metric of yeah. like stolen strikes and he was like top of the league was he he was in double a last year he finished in double a he was he bounced up and down high to double a he'll probably go back to double a then so he'll probably be my catcher this year yeah, yeah at I mean, some nice. point when i was at asu he was a top prospect yeah. i would say yeah. he was batting four for us and yeah uh, i think he's hitting he's struggled as he's of he's been recent. more of a defensive yeah, uh, I, I'd say he has more of a defensive presence so far in pro ball. Like I don't, I, right. you know, I don't, I don't know what that'll look like moving forward. But like to this point, he's he's had more of a defensive uh, presence, and like that's that's he's played to that strength to this point. So yeah, we'll see. You never know. I mean, As a catcher, you get like defense is priority. Yeah, for sure. For do sure. you have do you have your guy? Do you got like a guy you're throwing to right now? In the minor leagues, you don't because no. it's so it's 
whoever the GM wants to catch that game or whatever. Like it's it's more player development based rather than like, hey, this is my guy. Yeah, there's and there's some value to in like throwing a different guy too because right. you don't necessarily get to you know get to, get to draw up like the lineup card or like I mean you have some veteran guys that like have their have the the same guy they throw to but for the most part it's like yeah. more or less you need to be comfortable throwing to various guys different setups different personalities different communication but it helps to have that like relationship yeah. with that guy too I feel like if you're gonna have a guy then you're probably like a ten million dollar guy yeah. Because and for you to be able to call that shot, you, you have to gotta, earn. You have to earn the right to have right. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Damn. I mean, in high school, th- I was lucky to have a another uh, counterpart as a catcher, and so we were able to basically pick and choose our our pitchers were picking us. But I mean, game to game, it was like that. Uh, he, if yeah. he's going, I'm going. If he's going, he's going. You as know? a pitcher, I don't like. Be, I don't like to be put in that situation where it's like you have to pick yeah. because it's somebody's job so it's like i don't know it's not my place to cost somebody a game that could potentially change their career like it's not i don't right. want i'll let somebody else do that <laughs> you don't feel comfortable even putting your in no your just you guys just figure it out <laughs> yeah. and it's different too like if you're if you're out of the pen like yeah like you like who knows what your role will be, but out of the pen, right. like obviously you have pretty much literally no say no. in what goes on in, in, in game management. Whereas like as a, as a starting pitcher, like more of your veteran guys in the big leagues, they may have the ability to kind of like, like, Hey, I'd, I'd like to throw to this guy, this guy, I have a better connection with this guy. He seems to understand what my repertoire is. He manages the game a little better, et cetera. I would say baseball is even maybe a step further as far as analytics. They'll say you throw better because from an analytical standpoint, what you've done in the past, you throw better, better to this guy yeah. than this guy, and the team already knows. Um, when you say like, yeah, they're, they're probably reading into that. I would what about say. Uh, trainer wise? Are you uh, do guys? I mean, are guys more connected to say you than other trainers, or um, so on and so forth? I would say there's like a, I mean, to me, like the the a dynamic between. I'd say it depends on the level too, right? Because like you, you as a as a as a any coach in professional baseball, strength, uh, skill coach, et cetera, like we've got to realize that by the time that someone comes to us, they've probably had between I don't know five, six, seven, eight different strength coaches, five, six, oh, seven, yeah. eight different athletic trainers, pitching coaches, hitting coaches. So building like a, a relationship and a solid foundation on communication and transparency mm-hmm. and trust. I'd say it's critical because if not, like someone's going to say like, who are you to, to think that you know what's best for me in this mm-hmm. situation? And so I, Levi. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so uh, I, I would say that like, yes, there, you, there, there, there are instances where you establish a relationship that may be better. However, like if you're, if you have a great relationship with your a ball strength guy, but then you get promoted to double a, you don't get yeah, to take that guy. coach with you. Right. Same and same thing from from maybe double A to triple A, triple A to the big leagues. Say you're an established big leaguer, you get traded. You are uh, a free agent. You signed elsewhere. Like you don't all of a sudden get to, in most instances, get to pick and choose and cherry pick your. In a team, it's sport, right? Like in, in other sports, it may be different. Um, UFC may be different, right? Like it's it's not that that same team aspect that right. like maybe like a field sport is. Right. Um, like I might go somewhere <clears throat> and hate my. Maybe I hate the strength coach at the level I'm at or the pitching coach or whatever, but then I could maybe only be there for a week or I could be there all year. You don't get a pick. Like you might go, say you go to double A and that guy's got a completely different philosophy than like the guy that's in high. I think organizations try to have like an organizational philosophy, but everybody kind of has their own twist. For sure. I'd, I'd echo that. That's what I was going to say. Do, do, do those workouts change then when you're going from single a to double a you know are are you guys all kind of mm. you know in line with each other yeah that, that's a good question um it, i would say i'll say it depends on the organization like obviously i only have experience at this point working in, in two different organizations um i would say that organ organizational philosophies change um and that and, and when i when i mean that i mean like how, what are our means of achieving whatever outcomes that we want so like obviously Every organization wants to win at the big league level, win a World Series, et cetera. However, there's differing opinions on what goes into that, like the, into player development, different opinions, different like processes that basically everyone is out to achieve. At the end of the day, everyone's out to achieve the same thing, but there's different pr- 
processes in place, organization to organization. So yes, there's an overarching organizational philosophy. However, like within that structure, each coach has their own coaching philosophy um, within within the game. But it's tough because like sometimes you have uh, strength and conditioning coaches that have been in baseball 10, 15, 20 years. Mm. You have others that are in it. Uh, like I, you know, my first year in baseball is 18. So I'd, I'd like to think I knew that I, that I was good at my job. But like I look back and I'm like, man, I'd probably do some things a little bit different uh, if I were to go back and do that. But that's all kind of like part of the evolution, the growth from, from year one to now, I mean, season six now. So sounds like it's gotten, it's super important in, in uh, your career to really build that connection and that relationship with that person. And then you guys kind of work together and you can put your expertise in there and kind of get into their individual, what they're bringing to the table as well. Are you using, uh, we, we do a lot of cold plunge and sauna stuff you probably know from seeing Levi do you utilize some of that stuff too in there oh yeah oh yeah I'd say uh from from a recovery standpoint um we we utilize as many modalities as we can and I'll say that like baseball is a different animal in itself too because of the the frequency of play right we're playing 162 (sighs) games at the big league level and anywhere from 130 to 144 or 146 in AAA maybe. Mm. Um, so it, no, ma- no matter how you spin it, you're you're, yeah. you're looking at six to seven games a week, which is uh, that's kind of unrivaled in any other yeah, environment. Man. So what comes along with that is kind of the importance of recovery. Um, we're talking like in between uh, in between games from a pitching standpoint, in between outings, right. starting pitcher, relief pitcher. That looks a little different. Some guys may have to perform on back to back nights. Yeah. Position players, hitters. Back to back nights, whereas a starting pitcher, you got you know you're slotted every fifth day. Um, so to your question, yes, I mean we're we're using we're using hot hot tubs, cold tubs, we're using saunas, nice. red light therapy. Um, we're pushing the importance of sleep, hydration, nutrition. Like those are all things that those are kind of foundational elements um, to understanding what our business is. Right. Um, however, again, organization to organization, like budgets look a little bit different, priorities are a little bit different, but. To me, like you got to hammer the foundational stuff of the sleep, hydration, nutrition, Ooh, and then you can start to uh, like do all of these these things that are a little more on the, on the pricey side, right? But that are right. important as as elite level athletes to be able to recover in between performances. That is so awesome, hammering on the the sleep, hydration, and nutrition. I mean, how many people go after this and that, and specifying something, looking for a recovery, but they're not focused on that. Even getting your sleep. Up, you know, in like five percent. That's a huge benefit in recovery, right? Yeah, that's that's yeah, no, insane. <laughs> absolutely. And now, like, especially like we're able to to like objectively track that stuff too. Now, like right, everybody right. has some type of wearable. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like it. Yeah. Like a, a whoop strap, an or ring, yeah. a. a uh, even if it's like an Apple Watch, right? Like that's that's not great, but it's better. Than right, nothing. right. Something where you can uh, track on a consistent basis, have some kind of objective data that you can pair with your like subjective state of being. Like yeah. I feel this way. Okay, let me match it to the data. Oh, it doesn't it doesn't line up. Like maybe maybe I'm off, or like maybe right. the data is like I, I had this behavior yesterday, and the data responded in this way. And you start to identify things like, ooh, maybe I should stay away from like heavy alcohol consumption <laughs> a, a, a few days leading up right. to it you know it's right. like a, it significantly <laughs> hinder my performance yeah. um so we're able to yes like to to hammer those basics home and, and you're right unfortunately we run into a lot of people chasing after these shiny uh these shiny systems modalities these things that are like next level but they're but they're sleeping uh they're, they have an irregular sleep schedule they're, they're not right. hydrating appropriately they're right. and they're consuming things that are not good for their uh, like yeah. systems and stuff like that. So. That's got to be tough in the baseball culture because the history is kind of, ah, oh, we're going to go out. It's tough too. It's got to be tough. You're playing all those games and you're off late. You got to go release some steam sometime. What, what's there at late night? You know what I mean? There's not the best choices for nutrition. <laughs> no. And in some of the like cities and stuff that we're in too, like there's not a lot of options to be Ooh, honest with you. And, I can't imagine and it's easy to get in trouble too. Like, yeah. look, like when I was, the Diamondbacks of spring trainings at Scottsdale. Like Scottsdale's pretty nice, and it's yeah. And, and but it's easy to make a, a mistake, right? Like right, if there's right. there's casinos, there's bars, there's nightclubs, there's things, there's like these teasers, guys that are recently signed. They have a lot of money. There's a lot of like things that distractions to to kind of like temporarily pull you away from what it is that you're trying to achieve and. Ooh. And like ever, it's a it's a process, right? Like yeah. you don't expect everyone to come and have it all figured out. However, like that's kind of like we serve a piece of that puzzle and trying to like educate and, and uh, create awareness around like, Hey, look, these are the things that are going to be good for you. We don't expect perfection, but we do right. want you to take 
uh, responsibility and accountability for your actions. Yeah. And Definitely. through that, we can like get you a little bit closer to your goals. What's the communication like between doctors and trainers? And how do you guys manage that with mm. the players then? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Like a, a, a collaborative approach is like more important now than ever. So like as part of our like sports medicine and performance team, I mean, you got you got orthopedic, doc you got gen med doctors, orthopedic doctors, specialists, you have uh, manual therapists, chiropractors, athletic trainers, strength and conditioning, mental skills, uh, uh, sports dietitian, like the list goes on and on, like of these different disciplines that feed into basically resources to in, into like player development yeah. and then ultimately performance. So um, there's a constant line of communication. Like I, I would say the best organizations do it the most efficiently. Mm -hmm. The ones that maybe aren't as proficient, like there's a lapse in communication, like maybe, uh, uh, the, the, I'll just say this, the best organizations are hiring the best people and putting them in the best seats on the bus that are like all oh, kind of rowing the boat in the same direction. Um, so it's it's critical if you want to be as part of a high performance team to to uh, to hire good people and to like really promote the importance of education. And and then that collaborative approach is much more effective than someone trying to like one off to help this guy or one off over there to help so and so. And a lot of that is like budget, too. Yeah. Like you can't for the Dodgers example, they're obviously going to have the nicest stuff because they have the funds for that. We're like the A's probably not going to have the nicest stuff just because they don't have the funds. Like it's just the market that you're in as a player and as a staff trainer or whatever. Yeah. And, te and teams choose to allocate their money monies in different like ways too. Mm. like, so like obviously it's all relative, like every major league organization and any major sport is has, has a lot of money there is wealthy right like duh however like the ownership's um uh choice behind like where do we where do we invest this money where do we put it are we putting it in the people are we putting it in uh, facilities are we putting it in players in the free agent market like some teams again are more liberal in their spending and they'll spend in free agency they'll spend in their staff they'll spend in resources they'll spend in all these areas other teams are a little more on the on the conservative side and it's just like it's kind of funny to see like, Hey, look we'll back to the original point of like, we're all technically, we're all like trying to win it. Right. Like everybody wants to win a world series. If, if all else is equal, but different organizations choose to like invest in these different areas where it's like, okay, well you can like, do we, do we really prioritize player development if we're not spending in this area? Or do we really mean what we say in this way? If we're, if we're cho choosing this habit or this spending habit over here, so it just it's just kind of cool to see like the differences mm. in organizations. That's beautiful. Man, you're a super high level communicator, man. You're in your <laughs> voice, it's like listening to the the radio or the movies or something like that. Did you have did you have to work on the communication or you feel like you're kind of born with the gift of gab? Yeah, I to, I don't know. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> I, yeah, I I'll say that um, maybe a little of both. Like I I I've, I've always enjoyed speaking like public speaking and, and articulating my thoughts and communicating. I'll say that during my time with the Diamondbacks, that was of the utmost importance was like, look, it doesn't matter what you know, literally, if you're not, if you don't have the ability to communicate that to other Ooh, people. That's so, true. so like you that's can possess word. all this knowledge and have all of these types of uh, like, all, you know, everything going on up here. Yeah. And if, but if you're selfish and you're not able to like, if I'm not able to like take something, a concept that I understand, uh, to the greatest degree and like really dumb it down and explain it to someone who has no idea what I'm talking about. The baseball structure is a good example. Mm -hmm. Like you take a non sports fan, they're not going to understand what, what it means. Like there's the major league level, the minor league levels within player development. There's all these different levels. There's the international component of it in the Dominican Republic. Like no one's going to understand that. Right. But right. how can you take that, this structure that's very complex and dumb it down for anyone to understand. And that's when, you know, I think that, that you're, that you're an effective communicator is when you can like, really listen to other people, figure out where, nice. figure out like where they are, like meet them where they are type thing, right. understand, and then spin it in a way, take a concept that may be difficult to understand and spin it in a way where now they're able to like have a baseline understanding of Ooh, where it comes good. from. That shows the importance of, you're ta talking about getting, uh, winning and there's more money more and more money involved and you relate that to maybe 30 years ago when a strength and conditioning coach my my thought would go back be like back to high school or something where it's like all right we're just gonna you know get in the weight room and we're gonna do 30 sets of squats and just get to work you know what i mean it's not now that 
back then they got in shape or whatever but now it's such an expertise and specialty it's like you're looking in metal it's really i relate it to something in the medical field where you became a specialist like a surgeon you got to be able to like you're talk. you can hear them talking you know you're talking about at such a a uh, very specific level of how how to connect with the players, how to listen to them, how to work together with them, and obviously that's what it takes now to get to that level where we're talking about not just winning but millions of dollars and players' careers and their lives, and there's so much that goes into it. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. I mean, I, we're we're growing like I, I like just in general, strength and conditioning is still a relatively new uh, field, I guess you could right. say. Like. Yeah. Like there haven't, you know, dated back more than maybe 30, 30 to 40 years ago, maybe not even that long, man. Let's call it 25 to 30. Like that was kind of like the the uh, commencement of like strength and conditioning in baseball. So like I would say like generally speaking, we're still from a, from a 30,000 foot view, we're still in, in its infancy. But we've made humongous strides over the last like even while I've been in baseball, like we're talking staffs have expanded. Um, we're starting to, to see. Uh, not just an, an, like a, a strength coach assigned to each team, but we're looking at uh, assistants potentially that are that work at different levels of player development. We're looking at multiple strength coaches at the big league level. Um, we're looking at re- strength and conditioning coaches that are specifically um, minded towards rehab because um, that that's important. And then we're looking at like just a lot of different influential type things um, and bridging the gap between. Uh, the medical room like the rehab room the athletic training room the weight room um but then also like the the performance like where, where guys are actually asked to perform which is out on the field sure. um for in more of a skill type um environment so i'll say that like strength and conditioning has grown immensely over the last 20 to 30 years and it's still in baseball specifically we're behind in some areas but we're growing at such a rapid rate that that uh it's encouraging to be part of kind of this evolution and and like i think we're headed in a really nice direction as long as we harness this uh this like momentum in the appropriate way Mm -hmm. definitely so from like a sports fan or wannabe athlete perspective this fires me up Mm -hmm. but from a patient perspective you might know a little my story the 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 cancer stuff or whatever Mm -hmm. i look at where is the What's the mo- one of the most, I'll back up, one of the, probably the most important thing in terms of the physical part of it is going to be strength and conditioning, the reco- everything you're doing, the recovery modules, all that stuff. How can I get in the best physical shape so that I can have the best performance when I'm getting all this medical stuff going on? And I look at something like baseball where you, you, you talked about 162 games and I've learned through Levi a lot about that's where the, the, the breakthroughs and the future of health strength and condition and recovery modules and maybe ufc there and then maybe you got the olympics where they've they go really deep and into the studies on what it takes there's there's so much at stake you know in fighting you you know kill or be killed that kind of stuff but as it as it correlates to the rest of the population it's it's ahead of the game and i would love to see in the future that the gap to bridge a little more quickly to the medical field because so many it could save so many lives like what what you're doing isn't just strong for baseball what you know and we had another guy dan garner on here is a a top nutritionist sports guy you you guys are doing something that that people need this is this is saving lives i I, maybe you don't even realize like how I, i think that's it's not just about sports but it's about something for the population that you know maybe maybe you're ahead of five years of where it's going to be in five years this is what what you're doing is going to be what finally the medical field does for patients or whatever <laughs> yeah no that i mean that's that, i think that's a good perspective right and, and i really appreciate you sharing that because i i think at the end of the day like when when you kind of like <laughs> digress and like take this down to the most foundational level like it's really just filling a, a need it, 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 like we'll just if we're talking all strength and conditioning that's my bias that's my profession like Heck yeah. if at the most foundational level yes we have to we have to train guys to uh be prepared for the demand of playing the sport of baseball however we're filling a need at the most basic human ele- the most right. basic human level to basically meet them where they are right my wife's a physical therapist so nice. I can relate to to she works she works in, a, in, a, in an outpatient ortho clinic where she deals with general population patients coming off of for the most part orthopedic injuries so I'm talking like knee replacements uh, low back pain shoulder stuff um, low back etc 
Um, however, there are as working part of the medical team and, and more of a and more of a clinical like hospital type setting, um, neuro stuff like that. There are physical therapists, strength and conditioning coaches. I'm that I'm and and these people are working together to basically do exactly what you just said. However, it, it is still it is still in, in, in such a new concept and right, such a, yeah. a stage of infancy where um, I think you're right. I think we're all going to be in a much better spot um, when we're when each of us can within our own disciplines understand why is it that we're even able to to do this in the first place. And every one of us are human beings that right. have this the most basic needs in our life. And and basically playing baseball at this point fulfills a need right. for him. Yeah. Right and and working and strength and conditioning and baseball fills a need for me, but at some point those needs are gonna th that's gonna go away at some point. You know, like like the the days are numbered in in, in any of these types of scenarios and my and the way I see it. Right. Yeah. So then so then what? So yeah. To your point, I, I I think that it's it's critical that we have the people like we train the 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 new professionals the new people the interns yeah. the students the people that are going to be like some of these pioneers that are yes. like pave, paving the way yeah to to impact it at, at the human level at the most basic foundational level it's of true. a state or being as opposed to like a specific skill like baseball right it makes it fun too like for me i love that it's attached to sports it's it's something fun. We, you know, it's not just about going, I guess what I was kind of trying to say is kind of rambling around is, is we go and we enjoy these sports and we enjoy the performance aspect. What is it? What goes into it? What, how, how do you get to that point? So like, I don't know, it just makes a lot more fun to me when I meet somebody like you or somebody at sports teams, because we're having fun with that whole part of it too, instead of just, ah, I'm just going to be a, a cancer patient and I'm going to go here and I'm going to work through my, my therapies or whatever. This is something, you know, a little bit exciting to attach it to, I guess. <laughs> right. Like you're, you're, you're choosing, you're choosing to have an outlook. That's a positive go, one. Good call. Yeah, yeah. Like you're, I mean, Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I just think so much of it is like, I mean, I do believe that I'll say most things are a choice. Like, I don't, I don't know that I'll say this, how you respond to certain instances are, right. is a choice. Like things that you can, like none of us have control over maybe necessarily what happens to us and yeah. the, you know, what we're put through, et cetera. But I, I do feel like we have the power, each of us to make a decision of like, okay, like now what, and what, like, where are we going to look, where are we going to go? What decisions are we going to make based off the, the, the hand that we're dealt? And I mean, to your point, like, I think, I think in, just in my opinion, I don't know too much about it, but I'm thinking that making a, making a choice to ha have a positive mindset, expose, yeah. e expose your thing, e yourself to things that are going to bring yourself joy and happiness Beautiful. are going to yeah. do some, some, we talked about like the foundation of sleep, hydration, nutrition. Like yeah. we're talking about what's the most foundational thing yeah. in your life that makes so, you happy. So true. Yeah. <clears throat> you can't beat that. Damn that alcohol though. I had a, <laughs> like a beer like three or four nights ago and my sleep score got cut in half the hrv was way down it's like ah i'm curious if you talk to any other trainers in other sports but specifically basketball people are complaining about um you know guys taking games off and stuff like that in baseball culture we know that's fine you know I, I, there's guys who you know play two weeks straight and then you hear hey so and so is not in the lineup today and they're it's a rest day you know obviously the games are a lot more in baseball but um what's kind of your thoughts on what they're doing in basketball where these guys are taking kind of load management you know pretty serious yeah no that, that's a good one Work, workload management is like more prevalent now than it's ever been um <laughs> i i think uh i think that that's probably something that's come about through through just like data collection, sports science, like we're we're we're, we're smarter now than we've ever been, um, and, I, and just our ability to to uh, to collect the data and then, but more important than collecting it, like what are actionable things that we can do off of it? Um, now, interpretation of the data, p opinions are going to differ on that. Again, taking it back to like different organizations may have different philosophies on it. Um, if we're talking from a pitching standpoint, like obviously. Pitch counts have been a, a, a topic of conversation for some time in baseball, um, but now we're in a position where, like, we're we're monitoring 
uh, just in a general sense, and we'll talk strength and conditioning in baseball, we're monitoring uh, number of throws, number of swings, uh, distance covered on the field. We're, we're measuring uh, like velocity, it, the, the velocities at which guys accelerate and decelerate, and we're getting force plate numbers in the weight room. We're getting different strength and power assessments all over the place. Uh, body comp, I mean, the list goes on and on. Like, And we're taking basically all of these different metrics trying to formulate a picture that makes sense given you know given our environment of performance um i'd say it, it's i mean strength and conditioning is new but the field of sports science in baseball is even newer like we're talking a number of years here um but to your point on the on the workload management and what they're doing in the nba like there's some level of that occurring in major league baseball too it, it may not be as uh as as broadcast as loudly uh, maybe as it is in the nba just because of the the prevalence of like the the, the the games the, the structure of the games like in the nba what is it two games a week maybe yeah or yeah, like, yeah three three or four <laughs> yeah it's like a is a tough week okay so like we're talking maybe an average of three games a week whereas in baseball you're like you're, you're averaging at least six, somewhere between six and seven in the big leagues like six point something um with travel across uh, uh time zones and and longer flights some bus rides that are mixed in there um etc so I think that it is an important development for the sake of like longevity of a career. However, it has to be harnessed in the right way too, right? Like there's, because like professional sports are a business. Um, it's, it's really the entertainment industry. Like at the end of the day, it's they're putting on a show for the fans, right? Like, it, like we want to win a World Series. We want to win the baseball game. But at the end of the day, like it's, it's entertainment for, for as, as the enterprise is an entertainment industry. Um, so within that, it's like the discussion pops up of, okay, well, so-and-so takes the, the night off because of a load management decision. But all these fans came to see LeBron James. Right. LeBron James is not playing. How? What impact is that going to have financially? Like what impact is right. that going to have on the fan base? So it, it's there. It's very much there in, in Major League Baseball. I don't think it's as talked about because – of uh, the frequency in which we play maybe it's just not you know it's not like guys aren't taking two three four games off in a row um yeah. if there's not an injury and the stardom there's not like a lebron james you know the stardom's not the same as far as like there's typically not one guy on the team that everybody's coming to watch yeah that's maybe true. mike trout yeah I, I was just about to say yeah, yeah. maybe yeah and, and and like the number of the guys on the team that can that are contributing right like in Basketball, you got a five man lineup, maybe a thir what, 13 to 15 man team, right? Seven or eight man bench, and only like an eight man rotation, right? Right. So, yeah. and, in, and in baseball, I mean, we you got nine guys out there, they're taking the field to begin with, um, and then you got a you know, have a bullpen, and then you have some bench guys. Um, so that, I think that probably plays to your point, too. Right. Like, it's more, it's probably more of a team effort. Like, you can't, like, you're not going to win very many baseball get, games if you got three good players. You might win a lot of basketball games. You have three good players. Yeah, so, you right. know what I mean. Sure, like sure. so, yeah. so it, it's a little bit of a different dynamic. It probably stands out a little more when guys miss and it's and it's and it's tagged a workload decision or like yeah. a, a manager's decision or did not play coach's decision. Right. Yeah. If it's not if there's not an injury involved, I think people get all bent out of shape and yeah. But I'll say this from a performance standpoint: most of those decisions are made by someone that is viewing this from a from a performance standpoint. Like it's deemed that it's going to be valuable. And from a longevity standpoint, from on the long haul, I love when it happens in baseball because it gives a couple of guys a nod that might not get to start that play really well, and then they're getting a little bit more time on this day or that day. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I used to notice that a lot more. Whereas in basketball, it's like they're taking the net off, but they'll be right back in the starting lineup. You know, yeah. So, yeah. to the the DH too is like another guys. Now that's another position for somebody to feel like more opportunity for people to make money essentially. Yeah, there's some and there's some there's some new. I don't know if you guys have followed it or not, but there's some new uh, there's some new like rule changes in Major League Baseball this year too. To, like, right. If we're talking like we talked a minute on the on the like fan exposure and like buy in from the from the like from fans, um, the base of support really the financials of teams are relying upon that. Um, pitch clock is one of them that's like it's it's put in place to like speed up yeah, the game expedite yeah. the game like we're, we're going it's from, working too yeah i, think. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed well, i watched the game and enjoyed it i made it through more than three innings yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah no no kidding like the average spring training game yeah. is like under two and a half hours like 220 the average big league game last year i think was over three hours yeah so you're talking about like a 40 minute difference in just Dang. a 15 second you can clock. manipulate that stuff i saw scherzer <laughs> like uh so the guy the guy stepped out caught he held the ball 
the guy called time. So as soon as he gets in, he can pitch. So as soon as he got in there, boom, he threw it. So there's like, like a, a quick pitch. You can like chess, uh, chess, yeah. hurry uh, up off, play chess with it yep, too. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. seriously. It's I mean, there, there's a lot of like like, uh, like so cool. mind games that are going on and, and some like schematic stuff, like because the 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 batter needs to be in the batter's box with like eight seconds left. Right. So it's like the dude chills outside of the batter's box until there's like like nine seconds on the clock or like at the last minute then rushes the pitcher but then there's this reciprocal game that's going on of like that's cool well the pitcher's just walking around not ready but but it doesn't the pitcher could be standing at shortstop the batter's not in the box at eight seconds it's a strike yeah so do you, that's, that's do you think wild. it makes more cardio becomes more of a thing as a starter because you have to mm. throw the ball more frequently i was just gonna ask that. <laughs> like-minded people right i Yes, in short, I, I think that it becomes even more important that we have uh, like that we uh, have a, a cognizance around like the framework of being able to like manipulate heart rate. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about like the ability to stimulate, drive the heart rate up, but then recover for sure in between games and in between innings. But like even the ability to drive your heart rate down mm -hmm. um, through breath work, through visualization, whatever it may be, like like mm -hmm. the ability to utilize these different. Um, these different tools, right? Like we have these different professionals that talk on different things, whether it be mental skills, sports psychology, et cetera. Um, and, or from a physical standpoint, from an energy system standpoint, as a strength coach, we're working on, we're working on basically uh, work capacity. So that's repeatability, the ability to, to repeat high level, high intensity efforts mm -hmm. over and over and over again. The only way that we do that is recover in between bouts. Okay, right, so yeah, that's that's in between yeah. games, in between innings, in between pitches. If you're if we're talking from a pitching standpoint, from a from a position player standpoint, base running, the ability to steal a bag and not be gassed. Say you steal second base, boom, next pitch, the ball is single to center field, and you're trying to score from second to home. Like there's a, there's an importance in being able to recover. So wow. I think that more than ever, we have to be cognizant of um, what's being asked of you guys from a sense of like. It, you don't have 30 seconds to recover the way that right. you used to. Right. You can't just fiddle fart around and just at the batter and the umpire and everyone else is going to wait on you. Like now, there's an you'll be ready. To it go. plays mm -hmm. against you if you if you have a pitch clock violation, ball one. Right. Like there's an actual performance decrement if if we're not if we aren't doing our jobs and equipping all of our guys with the appropriate uh, like systems to be able to handle the demand of playing in these games at a high level too like imagine being in the big leagues you're stimulated from all these fans and all these people yeah. yelling stuff at you and like that's a whole different kind of ball game than than it is you know like pitching on a backfield here in arizona in the rehab right. type environment where there's no fans yeah, yeah what's this going to look like with guys on base now like you there's a guy on second base and you're trying to make sure you know you're giving him looks he's looking at you and you're looking at the clock you can and now only he's step off twice it. too if you step off a third Shit. third time, you, you, have, you to, have to pick him off, and he has to be out. If not, it's a balk. So he takes the next he base. He gets the base. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, this is going to be crazy. I it sounds like the players this. are going to need to be a lot more dedicated to strength conditioning and recovery now, too, with the demand going up. I, I wonder if and if they're not, there's there going to be more injuries. Is that possible? Yeah, I think so. It's a topic of conversation for sure. Yeah. I think it's a collaboration between, like we'll talk from a pitching aspect, like – it's a collaboration between the pitching coach uh, from from a strength and conditioning performance perspective. Like, hey, like, okay, there's obviously more tactical stuff that the pitching coach is going to talk, right? They're going to talk uh, different ways that we can do different things to, like, gain a competitive advantage over whoever. And, but it, but each guy has to possess the ability to be able to do what he's being asked to do, too. Like, it's, it's like, hey, I can go try to run a marathon, but if I'm not equipped <laughs> physically right. to run a marathon, like, it, it ain't going to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm going to break down. Yeah. Um, so from, if we're talking like from, from a, on a nightly basis, but, or like a, a grander scale, like from a longevity standpoint, year after year, you know, the dudes have 20 plus year baseball careers now, you know what I mean? Like the, 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 the hall of famers are last in 15, 20 years, right. like something's got to give like that. That's not, that's not an accident. Like that we don't accidentally just, uh, you know, I got lucky and I'm, and I'm, and I'm held up this long. There's, there is like purposeful, intentful effort playing into a systematic approach to get these guys ready. Um, right. We'll take a starting pitcher, for example. Each day in between is dedicated, like targeted specifically towards either recovery, 
work capacity, CNS, stimulation, like up up regulation to get ready to pitch the next day. Like each day serves a specific purpose, and then and it's our job to com- clearly communicate that, and more than anything, educate. Like people right. need to understand why they're being asked to do certain things. Like why are we doing this conditioning? Why are you putting me in that position to do that? Sure. Why are, why are we doing this strength and conditioning exercise? You know what I mean? Wow. Like, there's got to be some kind of purpose behind it, and I would, I would argue, more importantly, there needs to be an education. Because sure. if it's just a blind, hey, like, go do this, unless, unless you have a really good relationship with whoever, like, maybe you eventually just get to the point where it's like, hey, man, just tell me what to do. Like, that's right. that's cool. Or if you just don't know or you don't care, but like, most of our players care deeply about their craft, like their their livelihood, their career depends on it. For the most part, like mo- most people want to know at some level, why am I doing this, and, and in what way is this going to benefit my performance out on the field. Sure. Yeah. I think too, like knowing, knowing, like okay, today's this day, to, and then the next day I got it this, and the next day I got that. It makes the turnover of like a season, a series, like a month, like so much quicker. Because you go to the field, you're like, okay, today's recovery. You go to the field, like okay, today's CNS, or go to okay, today I'm pitching. Like for me, I'm I'm on like that three, like pitch, recover, CNS, pitch, recover, CNS, and it's it's the same like turnover every three days. So it, you know, that's why I walk in here and I'm like today's tuesday and I, it's but uh, for me it's like today's recovery day i don't know if it's monday tuesday or whatever <laughs> but i know i got recovery today seriously that's yeah funny. no that's good that and that, that that's kind of building on our our initial discussion of like the importance of i mean more or less we are we are literate like there's a there's a performance day right for everyone for a position player maybe daily for really? starting pitchers every fifth day for a reliever look you got to be ready to go back to back you may pitch and not pitch again for six days it's challenging as being in a, in, in a relief role really? however our job is just to make sure that whatever is being asked of a guy out on the field, that we are best preparing him for his next stint of performance. So like Levi touched on like each day, I mean, it's, it's more or less like, Hey, today is, is going to be a performance day or a, a possible performance day. The day after, man, we're pushing recovery hard. We're trying to get towards a parasympathetic state through the use of our recovery modalities, sleep, mm-hmm. hydration, nutrition, education. Um, we're, do, we're doing movement flows and things that are going to like downregulate the system. We want push recovery hard. Right. Day or, at, you know, stri- right after an outing, right after a game, into the next day. And then when it's time to, to, to like upregulate, move more towards that sympathetic state, fight or flight type mentality. We're doing things to uh, to wake up the system, to stimulate the nervous system, and and really light a fire under his ass for the next time he's going to be asked to pitch. Yeah. Right, and I, the the free time of a, of an athlete is important too. And there's a lot of management that goes into their day, and I think that's probably hard sometimes. They're like, oh, I got to do this and this, and I kind of see with you know studying some of these MMA guys that they'll have their assignment in the day, they got their training schedule, and then how they spend their time the rest of the day seems to also kind of be important too. I'm kind of cur- like for Levi, what what kinds of things are you doing? Because I know you work so hard at other things besides those assignments you get on the recovery and then on the performance days. Like what kind of things are you doing that keeps your, probably keeps your stress low, I'm guessing, and things like that? It's probably less, I'm doing less now than I've probably ever have. Uh, let me think. Yeah, probably I'm probably doing less now than I ever have, but a lot like realizing that a lot of what I was doing was to like just to be doing something because I couldn't just sit still and chill. Um, so like that goes into jujitsu, like hiking, MMA. For me, my like uh, basic what would you call that? Basically, like anxiety of not being able to just chill out. I channeled that into like jujitsu, hiking, meditation, breath work, stuff that was like essentially working on learning how to chill out. Um, where a lot of guys, I wouldn't say a lot, but maybe half the guys choose other things. Video games is like popular in the clubhouse, uh, cards. Um, I'm trying to think what else guys do. Yeah. I, to like building off of that, like I, I think it's important what, what you choose to do. Mm-hmm. And it's funny the differences in, and like personalities and, and like preferences too. Like, yeah, a lot Le- of guys golf. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, you're good. I, I like Levi is so like dedicated to what he's doing that, in my mind, in my opinion, he had like trouble like turning it off. Like, basically, I care so deeply about what I'm doing and I want yeah. so much to be uh, what like I envision what I want to be and I want so 
deeply to get to that point mm -hmm. that I'm going to, damn it, I'm going to do every single thing that I possibly can do within my control to do that. Great trait. Yeah. The, the, the downfall to that is like at times – it was you can overdo it you know what i mean and, 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 and especially act. in 180 days of a, and you're playing 160 games for sure like, and then at some point it starts to actually work against you uh, yeah mm -hmm. adversely yes right, yeah right. so so it i think that like back to like the education piece and like just the awareness of like look some people like because he's built a unit of a of a system here like he can get away with more he can get away with more, right? Like right. a guy that doesn't do anything, like if they start if they started behaving in that way, like they they run themselves right straight into the ground. Sure. So yeah. he can get away with more because he's 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 equipped his body right with right. more capabilities to handle that type of stress. However, like in my mind, him generating the awareness of like these are the things that I feel like really help me. Actually, maybe I have some proof that these things help me. Some of the recovery stuff, stuff like that. But he mentioned that maybe I'm doing a little less than I ever have before. But I think it's been like a five or six year evolution for Levi trying to figure out, all right, I've identified these three or four things that I need to do in between outings that are going to help me get to my peak state. And I don't need to do anymore. Right. Like th these are like purposeful things. Whereas early on in your career, you do some searching of like, right, right. okay, do I need to do that? Do I need to do this? Oh shit, none of that seems to be working. Oh, okay, I, can, I need to try everything. The problem with that is now you can't really decipher what's beneficial and what's not. Right. <laughs> I think in the negative to that is what you said. Like you can't, or you're you're just doing so much. But the positive to it is like because I've basically tried everything now I have a lot of lot more knowledge than like a lot of guys that just say, okay, Logan, you got it. You got it under control. I'm just going to keep my head down and you just tell me exactly what to do and I'll just listen and that'll be that. Like because I kind of, quote unquote, like bucked the system a little bit and tried all these things, now I have such knowledge of like, hey, this worked. Hey, this, this didn't work. And hey, I went this way and it led me down this hole and I went this other way and maybe it took me down this route. So I have knowledge and like perspective of things that worked and things that didn't, where I would say guys that kind of just head down and listen and never like challenge or like question anything, there, there's not much like knowledge that they can kind of fall back on. For yeah. sure. Now we see Levi in the head standing yoga position in the sauna. That's, that's <laughs> the evolution of Levi. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the unfortunate thing is like some, some of this just takes like experience. Like, yeah. unfortunately, you have to do some things, make some mistakes, like figure sure. out like, man, I'm yeah. probably never going to do that again. Or yes, this really works. But like some people never figure it out. Right. Like yeah. that's like careers, like promising careers end early. Wow. Not due to injury or not due to like a lack of performance, but like personal choices and decisions that are made away from the ballpark. Wow. And it's, and it's unfortunate that that occurs. I mean, we yeah. see it a lot. Um, and, and some guys just never truly figured out. Some guys figured out and it's too late. I think the people that are, are, are the best like self evaluators and can, and be honest with themselves and say like, sure. look, like what I'm doing right now doesn't seem to be working. You leverage the resources that you have available. But again, like I, I would say the most effective resources are the ones that can break it down, communicate it in a, in a simple and effective manner. Right. Mm -hmm. So that way you can pick up what I'm laying down. I can be the most knowledgeable guy, but if I'm spitting off all these words that you don't understand and this language that seems foreign, like that's not, I'm, I'm thinking I'm not doing you that much of, of, of a truth. You know right. what I mean? If you right. can't even pick up what I'm laying down, I'm trying to help you. And it's, there's this disconnect, but if you can take it down to the most foundational level, especially with like the young, young guys that were getting out of high school and stuff like that, like yeah. more or less they're, they're in search of things that like, please educate me, show me the way that that is professional baseball because it's a totally different animal than any other thing really right. that I know and, of. Right. And some guys are 16, 17 years old and don't even understand English and maybe have never even worked out in their entire life. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, like Logan has to translate like this workout or this philosophy to that guy and also translate it to me that's been like at Exos, IMG, Diesel, like PFS, OPT, like all these places. And like the same message, but two different ways because there's one guy that's trained everywhere and one guy that's never trained. And get you excited about it. Right, well. or get you to buy into yeah. it. Right. Whether if you're you've been all over the place and you've seen all these different styles and you have a knowledge, sometimes that's almost worse to work with because it's like, bro, you won't listen because you've been fucking everywhere and you think you know everything because you came from 
these big like mecca strength conditioning places where sometimes the latin guy might be easier because he's just going to be like bro i don't know right. yeah you got to meet people where they are for mm -hmm. sure it, it's it's a, there's a there's an art to like coaching for sure i mean like it's important to know like <laughs> the science like you got to like you got to know your stuff right like you to be an effective person but there i would say that man like especially in our environment where you're meeting people from all these different types of all, all over the country all over the world speaking different languages high training age low training age 40 year old vet 16 year old latin guy like i mean it's it's, it's literally all over the place but you got to meet them where they are because they appreciate it um you're going to best be able to like connect at that level um and then and then everyone kind of starts at a different place right like you're like where we where we started with Levi was a much different place than where we're going to start with a, a young Latin guy. However, much different place than like a, a guy that spent three or four years at a four year institution. Um, he he came in ahead of the curve, but like still a different place, right? Like different levels of maturity, different levels of knowledge, things that you feel like work, things that, even worse, things that you are convicted in that we know aren't going to work in professional baseball. So then you got to unwind the thing that's been going for so long to now. And, and sometimes you don't get it. You blow out, you get injured, right. something happens, like a, some kind of like career altering event takes place, or you just suck for a little bit. And then it's like, man, you're broken down to a level where it's like, can you please just help build me to where I need to be? But sometimes it's too late. The last thing I'm kind of curious about is what the player's mindset seemed to be like come August and September going into October and playoffs and stuff like that with the trainers are they exhausted now that the season's got gotten that far um are they more bought in some guys like how how does the season kind of develop to that point for you with the players yeah so when, when you were when you were asking that like my initial thought was recovery like right. it, it, it's paramount um just because of the things that we've talked on um, the ability to like literally perform on a nightly basis and the most important every baseball game is important. The most important ones are played in October, a little bit into November. Like if you're not if you're not playing in October, or November, you're not in the postseason. So, you know that, that's that's where that's that's the ultimate goal is to be able to play meaningful, impactful games through September into October into November. Like that's that's where we want to be. Um, I'll say that different guys handle it differently. Um, it doesn't really much matter our our ways, our methods of achieving our outcomes, as long as we are giving each guy what it is that they need, like on a day to day basis. But then, like taking a step back, what they need from a development standpoint. If it's a young guy in the big leagues, like we're still developing. I, I would argue everyone's always developing, but like the thirty year old, thirty eight year old veteran guy is is developing in a different way than, sure. than your 21 or 22 year old guy that's making his big league debut like much different stage <laughs> of development i would argue everyone's always developing or you're or you're regressing i, agree. I, I would think I don't, I don't know that there's a thing where you just say yeah. put i don't know that exists. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so i would say that like it's going to look different however now that we have the resources available to um collect the data communicate the data make actionable decisions off of it use our coaching feel like our experiences to realize what each individual needs like we can create these individualized programs and plans the same way we do in a weight room from a strength and conditioning perspective we can re create an indiv individualized recovery plan where now like, we're making sure that guys are at their peak state of being when games matter the most as we get late into the season we're trying to win a championship Ooh, that's Perfect. good so that I, there's Thinking of athletes that are younger, that are starting out age 13 to 17, they're, I know there, a lot of them are bombarded or, with a lot of information about what program should I follow for strength and conditioning. And there's a lot of different philosophies out there. What advice would you give kids like that that are coming up about where to start or what kind of principles to follow? That's a good question. It, it, I'll say that it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Like where, where we currently are, um, is it, we, like, we have a problem just in general <laughs> like seriously i mean they're i mean yeah, uh, it's true younger yeah. than ever kids are specializing and yeah and parents are oh batshit crazy <laughs> like, well, I mean, like what what i mean in all seriousness so like i mean true it, we're, we just have a i mean there, there's not it's not an accident that there are, that there are kids like going down like blowing out like 
Tommy John and all these types of things, like they're they're barely a teenager, right? Yeah, like that, that's that, insane. Yeah. That shouldn't happen. So I mm -hmm. I think that my best piece of advice would be um, di diversify your your experiences as much as possible um, for as long as possible. Nice. So I'm talking play as many sports as you can. Find yourself in different environments. Get out and do things that that, that look and feel nothing like your com competition environment. Um, if you're a baseball player like get out and 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 go for a walk go on a hike like go hang out with your friends play some video games play basketball play football like kick the soccer ball like do all these different things um that are going to just promote a, like a, a like a holistic well-being um so i i think early specialization is is a it's a huge problem in baseball i, I i'm not sure about other sports just because, like, I, I just have so much exposure to, to like our early specialization in, in baseball, and I know that it's an issue because of the the prevalence of or incidence of injury. Um, but then, right. but then you also just see like, guy, uh, like guys that are 16, 17 years old that are like burnt out from yeah. from playing these travel tournaments when they're like seven, eight, nine years old, and it's just ridiculous right. um, to to even be in that to even promote an environment that is like that is focused on that at that age in my opinion that that it's supposed to be fun and enjoyable and in a, a, a family experience right. and you need to to diversify yourself in a way where um, from a physical standpoint move in different ways front to back side to side rotate like enjoy yourself and 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 there's a time to commence strength training and 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 now we're trying to fill in these gaps of maybe what's not um, what's not being provided in these other alternative experiences. Sure. But, you know, we, 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 I mean, to your point, like we just have a big problem, I think, in, in youth sports in general, especially in baseball with, with like overuse injuries at an earlier age. Um, there's a lot of bad information out there. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of bad mm -hmm. coaching that, that goes on. And I, I don't know whose fault it is, to be honest with you. I just know that, that like I, I do feel somewhat of a responsibility to try to like – provide educational content and resources available um, just to like whether it's stuff if whether it's stuff like this or visual things on Instagram or, or, or YouTube it's any type of resource that can that that parents and coaches at the lower levels the youngest levels of athletic participation can reference to just be a little smarter in their practice right. design and in their decisions with their kids and stuff like that will will make it so when they get to High school, college baseball, if they're fortunate enough to play professional, like they're going to be in a much better spot. Now, sure. Right now. That makes sense. That makes sense. So we'll probably start wrapping up pretty soon, but got to get into the untapped a little bit. Okay. So thinking of the untapped, what is a situation where you got into a really rough place, a dark time or something, and you had to reach into that untapped spot? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I I'll say that I I feel like just in a general sense, like taking a step back, I've I've been pretty fortunate just to be I'm I'm fortunate to be sitting here with you guys and and experience the things that I've experienced. I'll say that like growing up on the East Coast, um, I'm from Zebulon, North Carolina, and and uh, didn't venture too far away for from for college. I went to Guilford College in Greensboro. Like I I grew up in the state. Um, my entire family for the most part lives in North Carolina, so. I, I think that uh, my first real like like challenging um, experience was was my first like move away from yeah. home, if if that makes sense. Like yeah. I, I I value family and the importance of like those relationships and the impact, and super responsible for where I am today. Like I I can't thank my parents and mentors and and every coach and 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 uh, and, and and advisor and stuff like that that I've had to this point in my life. But I think. To your question specifically, like coming out here to Arizona, first full time job, like that, it was a little bit of an like an alienating experience. Right, yeah. Came out here, didn't know anybody, um, didn't actually just uh, didn't know anybody with the D backs. It was more or less just a, like a, a job that was posted. I'm like, hmm, like <laughs> I want to stay in baseball. Um, really spent the better part of the first year just trying to find myself, like eyes open, trying to figure out where I belong. It was uncomfortable. Right. Um, I think that uh, the the conversations and the and the and the honesty that comes along with like working in this type of environment. I mean, it's a results driven industry. Like right. everybody, everybody cares about like what you what have you done for me lately type thing. And and if you're not producing and whatever that looks like, however you're evaluated and measured, you're 
you're not in a good spot. And I think that like I spent probably the better part of my first year and maybe leave, I can attest to this too. Like I probably didn't show up in the best way that I could have early on in my career um, as opposed to now. And I get it. Some of that's just experience. Some of that's like uh, bits and pieces of knowledge as I've gone. But I think like finding yourself in those uncomfortable situations are really like kind of where the, the growth occurs. Like nice. it, I think that's a pivotal um uh, time of being is like, look, you can either go in this direction or that direction right. and your daily actionable habits, like the small things that we do on a daily basis, all of a sudden begin to add up. And now we take a step back. We look back on, for me, what was 2018, for example, my first real experience away from home for an extended period of time, full-time job in baseball. I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing for the most part. You know, yeah. it's like, it's all relative, but I don't really know what I'm doing. It's like that, that was an alienating time, but I'm thankful that I just put my head down and said, I'm going to do one good thing after another. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to be okay with it. And then now in retrospect, I'm proud of that experience because I think it's played an integral part in like getting me to where I am today. I imagine that you probably spent a lot of time practicing what you preach during that time too. I can, I can just tell, we talk about that a lot is what is, who is this guy? We, you can kind of get a sense of somebody, did they really live that, that, you know, nobody's perfect, but living that optimized health, always trying to, would you say that was a big component too during that time? Yeah. I think you should practice what you preach for right. sure. I mean, I, that, and that doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes and that we don't like, uh, you know, learn from those experiences and stuff like that. But I, I do think that um, actively choosing, you know, we can do this or we can do that and understanding why it is that we're here in this position to begin with, sure. like super fortunate to even be blessed to be in a position to even begin with to impact and mold just young lives in general. But now like fortunate to work in a high performance environment that is professional right. baseball. Right. It's additional element on, on top of that. Sure. Um, I think, I think that kind of helped drive, um, a lot of the decisions that were made early on in my career was like, look, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in this position. Um, maybe, maybe too fortunate. You know what I mean? Like almost like, like what did I deserve or, or yeah. what did I do deserve to be in this position? But I think that I found myself in that position because people literally helped guide and mold and educate me to be able to like move in a direction to make this even possible right. in the first place that now it's like my responsibility to flip the script and, and figure out what I can do to help each individual guy. And it's going to look different. Oh, uh, that's good. Yeah. It's kind of like what you're saying earlier, the, the outlook that you choose, it's your, your choice, how you want it. Do you want to have a positive outlook? And then that gratitude too. those things together, man, that's amazing. That is good <clears throat> word. I love that. Yeah. I just, I mean, I, I do think it's important to just like let people know that you're appreciative of, of where of, of what they've done to get you to where you sure. are. You know, yeah. like I think each of us can probably like think back to like, man, this this moment in time was super impactful in my development yeah. as a human being, as a person, as a as a husband, as mm. as a as a as a uh, son or as a friend, etc. And then if we're talking from a performance standpoint, like think everybody can probably pull from like yeah this coach helped me do that this guy created this revolution for me or or whatever so i don't know i think i think to just kind of like wrap it up i just think that like the the uh the human element of things and realizing that ever, all of us are just in this thing at, at the most foundational level for the same purpose of just we're in search of fulfillment um we're all just we all do different tasks and have different hobbies to kind of achieve that fulfillment or that need that most basic need um, i'm just super thankful and appreciative of all the people that have helped fill the cup for me to help get me to be able to sit here with you guys and talk about these different experiences i've had so even young in my career still so right on That's i appreciate good it stuff. what you got going on this week levi um what is sunday monday Tuesday. i'll pitch wednesday and saturday that's about it so just throwing an inning uh yeah probably just it's been 25 pitches so like oh, okay. saturday yesterday i got like five outs so it's like ending in two thirds but sometimes it'll be maybe you'll get two sometimes you'll get six it's just 25 right now it's just 25 pitches and then once you, games start it'll be you guys rolling with like inner squads right now or live bp or what do you some live some inner squad okay. it just depends on like the day but that'll probably change tomorrow everything will change a little bit because everybody's showing up so it'll be Probably be more inner squads, getting ready for games. 
and like about a week and then we'll start playing outside competition and then it'll just be game every day from basically now until <laughs> september <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 ready or not Jeez. ready or not here we come so beautiful yeah, yeah. quick update on the, the whole cancer stuff we uh this week we did some further testing uh kind of based off of the surgery that we had a couple of weeks ago and we had a, a lot of growth of new cancer. We were kind of surprised. There was a little bit more than we expected into some new areas into the lymph nodes and things like that. So got a call. Uh, we decided to, well, the trial actually dropped me from the trial. Once he gets progression, then we know it's not working. So then we got to move on to, to other stuff. So the good thing is, is that my doctor called me up almost right away and he said, hey, Kyle, don't worry. I've been praying for you. I'm not going to let go of you no matter what we've thrown. He said, this is literally said, we've thrown the whole book at you. There's, you know, there's nothing in the book left, but he said, I've been searching all around. I contacted uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester to a close friend of him who's considered like the most experienced top lymphoma specialist. And there is a, a trial of something new uh, rather than hitting it with some standard chemo to kind of get it under control. Uh, we want to, we don't want to do that. We want to keep those in the, the back pocket because my body's starting to adapt to those. There's a new form of it, something that's brand new. It's never been used. It's a nucleated form of monoclonal antibody. So we're going to go up there and give that little chemo shot. So at the end of the month, I'm going to fly up, meet with a doctor, sign consent and get in the trial. And I'll probably fly up uh, once every three, three weeks or so. And uh, in the meantime, we're kind of debating, we got maybe six weeks till the, the chemo starts. We're kind of debating if we're going to hit it with another bridge chemo, or we've been hitting it with, in the meantime, with steroids. We try that off and on. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. There's always side effects with that stuff. When I say steroids, it's a kind of the, the steroids that shrink stuff. So it kind of, it's weird. It shrinks stuff and it bloats stuff. I, I wish it was a steroid that made me ripped, darn it. You know what I mean? <laughs> But it has been helping so far a little bit. It's kind of taken some of the edge off of the sides. Uh, on Wednesday this week, when I was kind of dealing with that news, I was like, whoa, this is probably the most cancer activity I've had in my body. This is just crazy. And I'm, I'm standing upright and I'm walking around and I feel pretty good. You know what I'm going to do today? I, I want to do something. I, I had a kind of a full day of work at, you know, at the TRC doing a lot of purchasing and things like that for the business. And and uh, I'm going to try to work out the most I've ever done with the most activity, you know, something to kind of fire me up, something, that, you know, so I went out there and did that. And as I was going along, I just felt like it, there was just kind of a dark cloud hovering over me. And, you know, you guys is working out. Sometimes you get, you get into that workout. And it's like, man, I can't shake this. I can't shake this off. So I was really spending a lot of time with God. I was kind of praise uh, in praise music, I was really meditating deeply and I was trying to push through these workouts, sometimes really pushing hard and other times kind of doing some breath work and things like that. And I really got this strong download I've been stuck on lately is in any day or in any time that we're really battling with something really difficult and really dark, that dark cloud over the head, there's always a window in there. I mean, if you, you get the flu or something, usually there's a point in that day where you feel just a little bit better. So I was like, I'm going to focus on that window. That window is coming in the day. So at some point, that, lit, that window's coming. Maybe the dark cloud's over. It almost seems like it's not going to pass or whatever. So I kept going. I kept going. And it wasn't until I, I, I went into uh, our jujitsu community, jujitsu MMA community in here, and I got around I got around people and something about that human contact and rolling with them and things like that, that window opened up and I just rolled with it. And it just created this snowball effect, I think, for the rest of the week. And I've just really been stuck on that is like, you know, no matter how hopeless or how dark or how rough or how boring or, you know, we get we get into these routines or whatever, there's always that window in there. So when we get that window, we just got to just go after it i think so nice that's, that's a little download yeah. i got thanks for week. yeah thanks <laughs> for sharing. that was great the really. uh the, the trial is it a pill this time or is it this one's going to be an infusion so we'll go up uh once every as far as i know so far it's once every three weeks and i think the infusion process will be pretty short even it's probably the infusion itself will probably be an hour or so and then the setup is like four hours maybe and, and all that kind of stuff but yeah it's just an injection into the 
the chemo port. And then I'll probably, I imagine there'll be a couple days of recovery and things like that. But I think we're going to try to do it in a two day shot, just fly up and then fly back. But sometimes, you know, nice. how flights are and yeah. stuff like that. We'll have to see how that rolls. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. You got anything else guys? I'm good to go. Man, we are so Thanks. grateful yeah, yeah, that you came today, that. brother. Thanks. Man, I just, I loved everything about what we talked to. I can't wait to listen to this again, actually, <laughs> and really, really try to stick into a lot of things that you said. There, there are some amazing takeaways today. Uh, I, I can't wait for the next podcast. That's everything we got today, guys. Thanks so much for watching Untapped episode 18. Love you guys. Have the best. Thank Peace. you, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, brother. Thank you.